Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the tutorial session. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Elena uh, Katak today. Uh, she's going to uh, uh, share with us how we can use simple games to teach uh, supply chain management. Uh, Elena uh, is um, uh, a shock and a Monica Mago Professor of Operations Management in the Jingdo School of Management at the University of Texas uh, uh, at Dallas. Um, her research area is um, uh, in the uh, behavioral operations management. Um, she, uh, her work has been published extensively on a lot of uh, uh, prestigious journals. Um, and uh, she was also a part of the team who won the 2000 Friends uh, Edelman Award. Um, and she also served uh, in a lot of uh, uh, journal uh, editorial boards. Um, and uh, I am very happy to have her today to share with us how we can use uh, games to enhance our teaching. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Well, um, thank you very much. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you for coming uh, to this. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will be worth your time. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about uh, using simple games in the classroom, and the uh, emphasis here is um, how do you take games uh, used for research and convert them to the classroom, right? So that's, because that was my interest, right? I obviously, I do behavioral work and uh, in most of my, my, my papers, uh, we ran uh, laboratory experiments with human subjects, which basically means that we have students play games in the lab, you know, in a very controlled way. And we design these games, you know, for, uh, you know, to, to address a specific research prob uh, problem, uh, but also these games are kind of interesting, right? I at least would like to, to think so. So some of them, um, I think, can be uh, converted uh, to the classroom uh, and be used in teaching. So I've been thinking about that for a while and uh, I've been actually doing that. So I'm happy to present this tutorial where uh, I'm going to share some, um, you know, s some things that I've learned uh, over the years in, um, in doing things like this. Also, uh, since we have so much time here, uh, I uh, wanted to let you experience some of these games. So we will be using, um, uh, I will, we will play some of the games that I, uh, I talk about in the paper and uh, most of them, Ho ho hopefully they will all work on a smartphone. Uh, if not, then you know, uh, so be it. But uh, at least, uh, at least some of them should work just fine um, on a smartphone. Uh, so I, I assume all of you have a smartphone, so we can um, we can uh, play some games. Okay. Uh, so this is the. Um, the agenda, uh, I'll talk about uh, some, I'll provide some general thoughts about uh, how to convert games uh, from research to the classroom. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about some of the topics uh, for which I use games. And this is not exhaustive, but I picked some of the ones that I thought uh, were interesting. Uh, so, I mean, the first one, inventory, is, is sort of obvious you know, probably uh, we all, you know, seen, uh, you know, the news vendor problem games that are used, it's a very simple one. Uh, but then the next two are, uh, I think, a little bit more um, interactive and uh, interesting. So um, we'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about those as well. Um, Yes, and if it turns out that we have time, I can, I can set up some other games on the fly here. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the platform that I use, uh, but I mean, this is really not about the platform because uh, different platforms can be used for this. Okay, um, all right, so something that I've learned in using, in trying to use uh, games designed for research in the classroom is that you cannot just take you know, uh, games that you designed um, for the laboratory and just have students in the classroom play them because it doesn't work very well, 
So there are several things that uh, we need to keep in mind. And, and, and uh, of course, one of them is length, right? So lab experiments um, are typically designed to um, last, you know, at least 30 minutes, maybe as much as an hour and a half, occasionally even two hours. Uh, you don't do that in the classroom, right? For, well, for many reasons. Uh, I mean, pedagogically, probably it wouldn't fit in most lectures, but also, you know, students would get bored because in the laboratory they get paid uh, for, you know, based on their performance in the classroom, obviously you don't pay them. So it's important to keep their interest. So one point is that these games have to be shortened a lot. Uh, another uh, issue, uh, you know, that uh, comes up right away is, uh, in the lab, usually we have uh, something called random matching. So if people play repeatedly, uh, each uh, round they're matched with a different partner, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's random so that they don't know who they're matched with, right? And the reason we do it is to, is to try to mimic kind of the single shot game, right? So that it doesn't become a repeated game. Well, there are technical problems with trying to do something like this in class, because uh, if you uh, do random matching, uh, then the game only runs as fast as the slowest person in the class. If it's a big class, like if you imagine, you know, 80 people and you match them all together, it, it is going to be really slow. So you cannot really use uh, random matching, uh, you know, in the class. And I mean, the reason, the reason for this is that you play around, right? And in order to rematch everybody, everybody has to be finished, right? So uh, the, s the slowest person is going to determine, and it's not just the slowest person, it's the slowest person every round. So I usually, uh, when I have interactive games, I um, uh, match people up as partners, right? And so each uh, group then plays repeatedly. Um, Sometimes I even tell them this uh, because uh, it, so it sort of fits with uh, the point that I'm trying to make, you know, when I teach about long-term relationships and things like that. Sometimes I don't tell them. So uh, I don't tell them anything. Uh, now in the lab, it's important to not use any deception, right? So you would, like if you imply to people that they're playing, you know, with a different person, that has to be true. Uh, in the classroom, you know, if you don't tell them anything and nobody asks, then you can kind of leave them with the impression. Maybe they are not playing with the same person. Usually they don't ask about it. So it's, 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 it's not important for, um, for class. Okay, so I may uh, come up with some other, let me see. All right, so uh, another thing is, is uh, the software. Um, so uh, games, Designed, uh, I mean, there are many different platforms that let you design games. At this point, there are several. Uh, there is, for example, um, software that a lot of people use for, for lab experiments called O3, which lets you use Python to design web-based games. Uh, the platform that I'm going to demo here uh, that I use for designing these games is called Sophie, um, Sophie Labs, actually. and. Uh, I mean, there isn't, uh, I like it because I know how to use it, right? And uh, it uses PHP and HTML uh, to design, you know, the screens and the, and, and the flow. Uh, like I said, O3 uses Python, and I'm sure there are other systems. Uh, so it doesn't really, so, 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 so you can design a game using whatever software you want. I mean, you can probably use, you know, Google, uh, sheets, you know, to, to design a simple game and, and, and that people play that. But uh, there's, in order to run, uh, so if, 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 if a class includes several different games, then it would be really useful to have a front end that allows students to log in and uh, that let instructor, you know, upload the class list and uh, that lets you uh, sort of show the reports Right, and so this kind of front end is, 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 is very nice to have. And I'm not aware of anything except Sophie Classroom for that. Uh, and uh, so that's what we're gonna be using. But that's, um, again, that's sort of, um, okay. So this is um, the type of things that instructor interface should do. 
right? So it should let instructor create a class, then add materials to it. Of course, that doesn't be games, could be some documents. Like um, I'm running uh, a game next week uh, in an online class and um, it's an interactive game. Uh, and uh, in an interactive game in an online class, uh, you know, people are, are going to log in at different times. So uh, the way I do it is basically I post the, the matching beforehand in a separate document so that they, so that people know who they're matched with and then they can get in touch with them um, and arrange uh, time to play the game um, at, at, at their convenience. So um, yeah, so uh, different documents also outside links. So this allows you to link, like if, if a game has been created using some other software, then that would also work. Um, and um, real-time monitoring, right? So as an instructor, when you're, when you're uh, you know, when the class is playing the game, you wanna know where everybody is, like what, uh, what round they're playing, you know, whether there is any group that's lagging behind or something like this. So it's good to have this kind of visibility. And then of course, uh, uh, show reports because uh, you want to show people how they did. Okay, so uh, let's uh, log into the system. So if you go to this, uh, so you, you, you can do this on your phone. If you go to this URL, um, class.games, you're gonna see a screen like this one and it has a login at the top. Uh, and when you click on the login, it uh, tells you, you know, it, it gives you these two options. So you can log in as an instructor or you can log in as a student. So today you'll be logging in as a student uh, and you will see kind of the experience that students um, have. So I'm going to uh, let everybody do that, so hopefully the URL is easy to remember, class.games. And once you uh, click the login as a student button, uh, there will be this screen that asks uh, for a course code. And the course code uh, for this one is INFORMS 2022. So after that, it, 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 it shows you this screen where it asks for personal login code, um, or it also lets you register as a, uh, as a new participant. So I will ask you to register as a new participant uh, because obviously I didn't know who was gonna be here and I had no way of, of, of like uploading anything. But as an instructor, uh, you can upload a class list um, to, this, uh, you know, to this platform and then uh, assign, pre-assign uh, personal login codes to students. Like for example, you can use their email, right? And then they just type that in and they don't have to register as a new participant. So when you click on the register as a new participant, it uh, generates a random code that uh, then later can be used. If you wanted to, for some reason, log into this again, you can use that random code. Uh, or of course, you can always register again. Um, so I think it asks you to enter your name and email. And um, after you have done that, uh, you will be on the screen that will have a button that would let you participate in the news vendor game. So uh, you can go ahead and do that. So I can show you while you're doing that, I can show you what it looks like uh, on my end. Okay, all right, so this is the instructor interface and I can see uh, the students. Okay, so there's only one person so far logged in. Um, so I hope uh, we can wait a little bit to, uh, you know, so that more people can log in. And uh, this is the news vendor game and this is showing me um, I know where people are. Okay, so it looks like this is not refreshing. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, so click on participate. 
Yeah, and th and 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 you can play uh, the game. Okay, so you, after you click participate, you will see a screen that looks something like this. It gives you news vendor parameters, so I don't have to explain to people, I guess, what the news vendor problem is. Um, inventory, you know, uh, one uh, period decision problem. There is a, 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 a stochastic demand. In this case, it's uniform from zero to 100. And uh, you have to order uh, units and the uh, uh, cost, uh, or, or you have to produce units. Uh, cost is $3 per unit. You sell them at $12 per unit, uh, right? And uh, you have to decide how many units to order, right? And so there's some things here, like there is this calculator, which it can, in other games, something like this could be designed to do more complicated calculations here. It's uh, uh, it's calculating service level, which is a pretty trivial calculation given that demand is zero to 100, but this is just to show um, you know, what it does. And it also shows you, so once you uh, place your order in, in, in to this uh, bottom box, uh, you can click submit and then goes to the next round. So there are 10 rounds, so I'll let you, um, I'll let you play um, for 10 rounds. Uh, just to see, not just to get the feel of what this looks like. Uh, it, every round, it, it's showing history here, uh, right? So you can, after you played a few rounds, you can sort of see what the demand draws you got and what uh, orders you placed and the profit you made and so on. Okay, so, um, So as an instructor, I can kind of see where people are here. Okay, so now it's telling me there's 17 people playing. Hmm? Oh, uh, right, so it's not two boxes, and, and, and maybe this is a design issue here, but uh, the top box is just a calculator, so you can enter different numbers in the top box. Uh, in some games, it actually makes sense uh, to try different numbers, but the actual order is the bottom box, and you don't have to put anything in the top box at all once you, you know, uh, in this, uh, th this game is pretty simple. So I usually tell people to try to make as much money as possible, uh, even though I'm not paying them. Uh, I will show the, the scorecard. And it, it, it motivates, you know, it motivates people a little bit. They would like to see, you know, their name at the top. Of course, it's not the same as, uh, you know, as paying people in a controlled way and uh, when, when you do this for research. So if I recall correctly, this interface, it, it shouldn't let you enter a negative number. I don't think it lets you enter a number above 100. So I, I think it's, it has some obvious uh, checks. Always a good idea, I mean, I, I, I put even more checks on classroom games than I do in games um, that I run in the lab because some students, they, uh, you know, they just like to play around and see what happens and uh, try to mess things up. So um, there was one time I was running, uh, I, 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 I teach about auctions in my uh, purchasing class and I was running an auction and it didn't have a check on the bid. So people were placing these huge negative bids. Uh, <laughs> just to mess, uh, you know, just to mess things up. Of course, you know, uh, that completely messes up the graph, right, of the bid. So, uh, yeah, so uh, after that, I put in a check to not allow people to uh, bid, uh, you know, below their cost. It's a reverse auction, so it's a, it's a cost, right? So the, uh, 
which I would not do in, uh, you know, for research. So for, for research, I would allow people, well, I probably wouldn't let them enter a negative number, but I would uh, allow them to bid below cost, right? Because constraining them, it's kind of, I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, sort of direct behavior towards um, optimal and you wanna avoid that. But in the classroom, I think it's fine um, to do stuff like this. Okay, let's see how we're doing. Yes. Yes, so if you go to class.games, there is a link there to uh, create a free account. To, to, to try it, yeah. Okay, so, okay, looks like a couple of people finished. Yes, right, so you can make, uh, I mean, this particular game, uh, you can change, you, you can make it uniform, you can make it normal. You can change uh, the location of the uniform distribution, you can change the mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution. But um, a nice thing about this is that, um, like I built this game, so if I wanted to add, you know, some other distribution, I can do it, right, so I can actually create another version of the game where I change something. And so, uh, I and it's fairly easy, especially if you are already starting with a game that exists. So, uh, I, I mean, you do need a little bit of uh, programming skills, but like if I can do it, obviously not that much, right? <laughs> so, um, all right, so let me, just show you uh, the report. So this has a reports feature. Okay, so this is what we have. This is here, right? Uh, and this is, I mean, if you read uh, any news vendor papers, this is very typical outcome, right? Uh, so uh, of course, optimal solution to this is 75. Uh, demand is 50. Um, the green line are actually uh, average demand draws, so they're right around 50. The orange line are your actual orders, which are below 75, right? So we see here the pull to center effect, which has been documented many, many times, uh, and including apparently with people, you know, with PhDs in this. <laughs> Um, and uh, then, you know, you, you, there are some other calculations um, that I've done, right? So like optimal service level is 75, here it's 66. Uh, and it also, um, I, I made a calculation about uh, like what the loss is, right? So um, optimal order would have resulted in, uh, you know, a profit of almost 400. And here average profit for this group was three, uh, 36, so the loss is uh, about 14%, okay? So that may be kind of a good uh, motivation to explain why, you know, now I'm going to teach you how to solve the news vendor problem, right? Because uh, just naturally, you know, you don't do as well as when after I'm gonna t teach it to you, uh, you'll be able to make um, you know, more money, and of course, um, you know, this is a game that uh, is close to, you know, some of the very realistic situations. Okay. All right, so, um, yeah, yeah, so before I move Sorry. on, so are there, yeah. I just wanted to ask mm -hmm. if there is a, a leaderboard, because a motivation for students is sometimes it's just competition, uh, so I just wanted if this is a, uh, Included in, in your games. Oh, the right, yeah. Yes, yeah, so there is a, uh, yes. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, so there is a scoreboard, right? So you can sort it by um, make this bigger. So you can see who won, you know, you can see what average order they placed. Uh, it's also interesting that uh, in this game, usually the person who uh, places optimal order the whole time, they do well, often they don't do the best. And this is because uh, the other people, so people who were ordering a little bit more than 70, um, or a little bit more than 75, they also got lucky with uh, good demand draws, right? And if that happens, then you make more money. So um, uh, that's, I think, it can be a, an important point to make, right? Because the world, um, there is uncertainty in the world, right? So, uh, you know, there is a good answer, right? And if you, if you do, you know, the right thing, that sort of a priori the right thing, uh, you'll do quite well, but it's also possible that somebody gets lucky and, 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 and does better, right? So, yeah, so I, sh I, sh I show something like this, um, and uh, also, you know, I would ask people, like when I debrief it, I would ask like the person who made the most money, I would ask them how they came up with this order, you know, of 80, and um, I'm not sure, you know, usually what people would say to that is, is, is well, so, 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 so they would make this critical fractile arguments in, 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 in their own words, right? That, uh, you know, you're making a profit of nine on every unit, it's only costing you three, so you should order more than average, and so I ordered a lot more than average, right? So it's, um, some, so some people understand this intuition, uh, and then there are people also who uh, order close to 50 that basically think that this game is about guessing what the demand is going to be the next round, right? And, and so they miss kind of the economics of it. Of course, uh, I'm sure there is nobody here who did that, but um, in, in the class, there would be a lot of people who are ordering around 50 or so. And, and, and when I ask them, that's what they say. They say, well, you know, last uh, period demand was 40, right? And I ordered 60 and it was 40. So then next period I ordered, ordered less because I'm trying to, you know, order as close as possible to what demand is going to be, which is, of course, that is the incorrect intuition for this game. Any other questions? So are you observing like uh, that the students get uncomfortable when you show their names in the screen? Well, so this is why it's, it's sorted uh, like this in pages, so I, uh, only the top ones show up. So you only show the top I ones. don't <laughs> uh, sort it in the other way. Uh, so I tend to not, yeah, I, t I, I, I tend to not show people who did badly. Yeah. Is it a good strategy to play this uh, before explaining news vendor or then you explain news vendor? I play it before I explain the news vendor. Yeah, so it kind of breaks the ice. Uh, then, so after this, I would kind of give them the motivation about why this vendor is important, and you know, then I would show them the solution, and yeah. Uh, I mean, my guess is that if you played this after you teach, unless you play it like right immediately after, there's probably not going to be a big difference, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> which is, uh, it's saying something about this. But um, you would still, you know, there would still be pull to center and most people will still not order 75 all the time. Uh, so hopefully there is some improvement on average, you know, but yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so um, depending on the class, there are some extensions uh, to the news vendor that can be 
you know, created. So like I, for example, uh, I have this dual sourcing game, which is it's just like the news vendor, but um, when you order, you, you, you basically have a second source, right? So um, I, I give them a little case study that I wrote for this purpose where I essentially tell them the story about the company that sells bicycles, right? And they order frames from overseas that have long lead times. And then they also um, have a local supplier um, where, you know, that would sell them uh, frames that they can use to assemble the bikes and they're more expensive. They're like uh, 300 or $500 more expensive. And then the question is, should they do it, right? So I would, I would teach this after I, I, I taught the news vendor um, and um, they can play this game kind of as part of the, um, well, yeah, so I, this is not the screenshot. This is a screenshot for the next one, but for the dual sourcing game, basically, you know, the mechanics of it is just like the new, except that when you, um, you know, when you didn't order enough, uh, the remainder sales are not lost. They are just ordered locally, right? And so that, cr that changes the critical fractile. Um, and so what this does, and I mean, I think this is actually kind of an interesting point if you talk about risk uh, and resiliency. Um, the uh, variability of profit decreases with optimal solution. It also decreases uh, in, in the game, right? So um, the optimal order for, for this dual sourcing game is lower than in, in the news vendor game, right? So you essentially you're ordering less from overseas because your cost, um, you, you know, your cost of underage is lower, right? So it's, it's sort of using this intuition to try to explore um, related problems. So I usually would, what I would do is after I taught the news vendor, then I assigned that case study and I uh, try to let people figure this out, right? And so when they, fig if they understand the critical ratio and what it means, a lot of them can figure out what the optimal order is in the, in the dual sourcing. So another uh, extension is, um, you know, for contracting, right? So there is a game and this is from um, a paper that I um, had in 2009 where, um, well, we have a number of treatments in this paper, but um, uh, the contract where one side is estimated and then the other side is the decision maker. So in the contracting game that I uh, play here, the decision maker is the supplier and they're proposing a contract to the retailer and the retailer is the news vendor and they're opt, uh, ordering optimally given the, the contract that they got. So um, we can do this with a wholesale price contract and then talk about double marginalization uh, and then uh, talk about coordinating contracts. Uh, and this is a screen from the buyback contract where they um, you know, place a wholesale price and rebate. Um, and. Uh, so um, I let people play that. What happens in this game is uh, rebates are way too low. They're always a lot lower than they should be um, in, in optimality, right? So people are generally not, I mean, they make more money than in the wholesale price, uh, but they don't come close to coordinating the channel because they set the rebate much lower than it should be given the wholesale price, which is also what we found in this paper. So. Um, Okay, so any, let me see. All right, so these are the learning objectives, uh, roughly speaking. Um, so, you know, for news vendor, important thing here is to talk about the economic trade-offs, right? Uh, and then uh, in terms of the game, I show them that there is this pull to center effect and you see it all the time and so uh, people kind of underestimate the economics of it. Um, and then uh, I use the dual sourcing game to talk about supply risk um, and the costs and benefits of, um, you know, diversified supply base and things like that. Uh, yeah, and for contracting, uh, double marginalization, channel coordination, um, things like that. Okay, so 
questions, comments? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. So another topic I, I use. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, how do you uh, structure these games in your lectures? At the end of the lecture, or you have a session just with games? How do you do that? It depends. Very often it's at the beginning, right? Yeah, very often it's at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, sometimes there is some kind of a previous discussion of whatever happened, you know, in the class before, answering questions, you know, from the homework. But then, uh, yeah, so usually this would uh, introduce a topic, right, rather than kind of playing it after I taught the topic. So it, it, it serves as a way to motivate, you know, teaching them something about optimal solutions and, um, you know, maximizing profit and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so that was inventory. Um, okay, so uh, I, 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 I teach a class in um, strategic procurement in our master's program in supply chain. Uh, it's a core course. And uh, I use a lot of games in, in, in that class. So um, I teach a module, um, several classes uh, on reverse auctions. And so um, in, in, um, in those classes, I teach, well, obviously, you know, I, I, I use an auction game to um, let people experience what it's like to be in an auction. Um, and so like this would be something that resulted, you know, in a, like this is an auction with three bidders, right? And so like uh, you can see like, you know, I guess it says here, yeah, so your cost was 70, you didn't win, uh, you bid 90. Uh, the winner uh, won, you know, with a bid of 75 and a half. Right, and there was another bidder who, who bid 101. Uh, and then they see this, um, this kind of um, report. So this gives them um, experience with like bidding in an auction, uh, which a lot of people haven't done. I mean, some people bid on eBay, but surprisingly, some people didn't. I mean, that's, uh, which I don't know if eBay is becoming less popular, but uh, usually when I ask people, like, have you uh, experienced eBay, only maybe like a third of the people raise their hand, uh, which it used to be more. Uh, so some people never actually bid, you know, in a more or less a straightforward auction. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting for them. They, they find it fun. Uh, another uh, thing I teach about auctions is uh, that uh, way you design them really matters, right? So there are details that matter. Like for example, setting reservation prices is really important in a reverse auction, right? Because if you don't set the reservation price, then your incumbent supplier may not even take the auction uh, seriously at all, um, right? And they can just place a high bid and expect to get the contract anyway because they're the incumbent. Right, so it's important to set the reserve price. I have a game uh, for setting a reserve price. Usually it, it's a single person game and I, I usually assign it uh, as part of some homework um, that I give. I don't necessarily have them play it in class. By the way, sometimes, you know, you ask me when I play these games, sometimes I assign them as homework. Like in an online class, the news vendor game, they play um, as part of the homework assignment because it's a, it's a single person game, so they can play it on their own time. So that's convenient. Okay, so um, the game I'm going to show you uh, is a little bit more uh, complicated. So after I've taught them about, um, you know, about straightforward auctions, talk about designing auctions and different features um, in standard auctions, uh, I talk about buyer determined auctions, right? So, 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 so these are auctions where um, the, the buyer collects all the bids, but they don't commit to awarding the contract to the lowest bidder. They can look at all the bids and then they can, um, 
award the contract to somebody else. And this is actually very common. So this is, uh, most reverse auctions are like that. So the buyers don't like to commit. Uh, the reason is that uh, they may, uh, you know, if, if all of their suppliers haven't been pre-qualified, then they don't want to commit to awarding the contract to some supplier that may not be able to fulfill, um, you know, the contract. Okay, so I, I designed this game. This is based on a paper uh, with Nicholas Fogger and Akam Wambach, uh, Management Science 2019, that's about trust in auctions. And uh, the game is like this. So first of all, so it has three players. There is a buyer and there are two suppliers. And uh, suppliers have a cost of 10. So everybody has a cost of 10, uh, so it's a full information. So they're not really competing on, on price. Well, I mean, they are, but uh, there is no advantage. Nobody has a cost advantage. Okay, so this graphic here, which um, they see on the screen, and I'll, I'll let you play that. You'll see that's on your screen too. Uh, it basically, uh, so what this shows is that um, the buyer can benefit if the supplier puts in costly effort. So if they um, choose a quality level that's above one, it's only costing them um, you know, 10 for, uh, for each unit of effort, but uh, the buyer benefits a lot, right? So the buyer benefits, the buyer benefit is this orange bar and the supplier's cost is, uh, is the green bar. So uh, there is a lot of potential efficiency that you could get if only the suppliers uh, were putting in something more than the minimum effort. It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I think it's a problem in procurement. I think it's a real problem because unless you can write a contract based on the effort, which you can't always do that because the effort may not be visible, right? So you may not be able to contract on the effort. You might be able to contract on the outcome, but um, there is a lot of stochastic element. I mean, there may be a stochastic element in that, so it may not be practical. So in long-term relationships, you know, uh, suppliers may actually not put in the minimum possible effort, even if the buyer can't, um, um, you know, uh, determine what their effort was. Uh, and so the, I, th I think the uh, optimal solution, I mean, the efficient outcome here is something like five or six. Um, and so um, I haven't played this game. So supplier moves first. So two suppliers place bids at the same time. So like, for example, let's say two suppliers, they place the bid of 50 and 60. And then uh, in a buyer determined auction, uh, the buyer would see those bids and then they can uh, choose uh, to whether uh, to award the contract to seller one, seller two, or they can also reject uh, both bids, which was the case in the paper. Um, in the paper, we also had the price-based treatment where he had to either select a low bid or reject both, but I don't play this in class because I only play one treatment in class. Okay, so, um, all right. So after the buyer selects a winner, this winner um, has to choose uh, the quality level, right? So he, ha he has a screen that looks something like this, says, okay, your bid was 50. They also see this graphic choose your quality level, and uh, then there is an outcome, right? So for the winner, you know, he put in here a quality of one. Uh, he, uh, so this is for the buyer, right? So the, the winner put in a quality of one. The buyer value was 15, right? So he lost $35. Uh, right, and then the bidder won uh, 40, right? Now, if the, if, if the bidder would have uh, placed, you know, if, 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 if he would have chosen two, then uh, they would have both made money, including the buyer. So the buyer would have made money even with two uh, with a price of 50. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see if we can play this.
Okay. So if you go back to the original screen, uh, which um, if you logged in, there should be a tab still open, right? So you can uh, close the news vendor tab and uh, go back to that screen and, and you should see the trust in auctions. <coughs> So uh, what this is, um, so you're now on the screen that says wait for the instructor, right? And so I would put that in if I wanted for some reason for everybody to start at the same time, right? So then I, um, I have that ability, right? So let me see, I think that if I uh, put in So also this has to be uh, in multiples of three uh, so, okay, all right, so we're going to have three groups. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> So what the, the, the feature that I uh, basically used here is when I started the game, it locked it. So it locked everybody out who wasn't logged in, right? So there is going to be three auctions running here. Um, sometimes it makes sense to do that. Sometimes not, right? So that's just when you design the game, you can decide whether you want to do that or not. Okay, so once the winner selects quality, which I think that happened in one of the um, groups already for the first round, uh, then everybody sees the results and then they can play again. I think this one has, um, how, how, how many rounds does this one have? It should say on the screen. Is it 10? Okay, so we may, we may not need to play 10, uh, just to give you a sense of how this works. But let's, let's play a couple. You are matched with the same person, yeah. Um, yeah, so as I said in the beginning, so in, in, in class you pretty much have to match people like that. Uh, I don't announce it, right? Although I'm not sure here, since you don't know who it is, it's probably pretty hard to do anything about it, but. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, right, so you could, uh, yeah. Oh, you're not happy with the buyer. But, uh, so why not? Oh, you re rejected your bid. Was it because the other bid was lower? Oh, you rejected both bids, yeah. So, and this happened in the experiment too. So you see this is, in, so this is a price-based auction. Right? So the buyer basically can only choose uh, the low bid or uh, reject both of them. And the buyer can lose money, right? So if the lowest bid is, is high, in fact, if it's more than 15, then the buyer might lose money, right, if the winner doesn't, uh, you know, put in quality of at least two. So what happens in, this, in the price-based uh, auction is in the beginning there are some um, buyers who take the, the, the risk, and there are some suppliers who, uh, you know, deliver quality that's above one, and then it deteriorates pretty fast. Uh, and by the end, pretty much everybody is just bidding, you know, 11, right? And the buyer, you know, and, and, and delivering the quality of one. Now that's, that's very inefficient, right? That's uh, very inefficient. So then the question is, well, what can you do, right, to improve this? And it turns out that the buyer determined auction, where the buyer can also choose the, high, the higher of the two bidders, actually improves things a lot. So I don't think we have time to like go through this, but that is, uh, uh, that is what happens. So let's see, so this is, so far we played uh, four rounds or so. Okay, so let's see. So what this is showing is, uh, well, this is showing the average bid, the average quality level, or, or, or rather the average bid for each quality level. And you can see that it's not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's see if there is a, yeah, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of data. Uh, this is kind of showing the bids. Um, yeah, so there are some, I mean, we only s s started, but uh, so far the buyer is actually not losing money. Uh, and the average quality is above one. Uh, and yeah, so it's actually doing pretty well, right? So what usually happens in classes by the time they play 10 rounds, uh, a lot of the buyers uh, lose money. Yeah, this is, this is giving some error messages because it hasn't finished. Uh, so these reports assume that everybody played 10 rounds. That's why it is. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's... That's this game, so... Um, It um, usually takes, uh, you know, maybe 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes for them to play. Uh, so they play a price-based, then I have, a, I have this discussion, right? So I, I ask people to explain, you know, to tell me, like, um, what happened. And usually people say something like, uh, buyers say that, well, I uh, selected this supplier and then they, I chose low quality and I lost money, so then in the next round, I didn't wanna accept any bids, 
you know, that were, um, you know, above 15, and then the sellers were saying, well, we're getting rejected, right, so we have to just bid lower because the buyer is rejecting all the bids, and so we ended up, so, 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 so it sort of uh, deval uh, deteriorates very quickly, right, so uh, usually 10 rounds is enough, and then I talk about buyer-determined auctions. I haven't played the second part of this. Uh, and usually there is a much better performance there uh, because uh, just the fact that the buyer can select a higher bidder, and it actually, um, it, 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 it basically causes, um, well, it, 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 le it lets, um, Bitter, um, it lets the bidder send a signal, you know, that they will deliver higher quality because they're bidding high, right? And so even if they like um, deliver two or three, they can still make a lot of money and the buyer can make a lot of money. So there is a lot of efficiency um, there. So uh, in there actually there exists an equilibrium in this game where um, bidders uh, bid high that, that basically has high prices and high qualities. Uh, and in, in the price-based auction, there is only one equilibrium that is low price, low quality. So, um, okay, so I don't tell them about equilibrium, but uh, I, I, I demonstrate this and they kind of discover uh, that this happens. Um, so this, by the way, this game um, is related to the trust game, which is one of the iconic games you know, in behavioral economics. So this is a game where it's a two-player game. There is the employer and employee, right? And so employer offers wage, and then employee delivers effort, right? And effort is costly. And so what happens, so, so this game also has a dominant strategy for the employee to put in the lowest possible effort, and for the employer to give them the lowest possible wage, right? And it's inefficient, but what happens in the lab is in fact there are high wages and high efforts, right? So this is a kind of a competitive version of the trust game, essentially. Uh, but it only works when you have buyer determined. It doesn't. I mean, if if you, if you just have if, if if you just have a, a an auction that is price based, then uh, it still it still uh, deteriorates to bad equilibrium. Okay, so this is what uh, you can use games for in these, um, you know, in talking about auctions, of course, bidding, uh, designing auctions, uh, and then trust in auctions. It's, it's a good uh, way to start talking about, you know, about incomplete contracts and moral hazard, um, right, and competition versus cooperation and how you balance, you know, how you have to balance the two in procurement. Uh, you know, because uh, you need uh, your supplier to cooperate with you, otherwise you're gonna end up in this bad equilibrium where you have low, low price and low quality. Okay, so um, this goes until 6.15, right? Okay, all right, so we can talk about one more. Um, so this is a game um, that I uh, designed. Um, it's, it's very similar to Ozal Poser's um, game in this paper. So this is a, f a pretty famous uh, paper about trust, um, Ozer, Zhang, and Chen, right? And they have a game in there, and that game, I think some people use that one too. So that's um, essentially in, that, in, in, in their game, um, the, you have a retailer and a supplier and retailer has a better signal about demand, right? And so it, uh, it has this parameter, eta, that the retailer knows, and then he sends a signal to the supplier about what it is, right? Well, I always thought, I mean, it's a very nice game, but I thought that it's, it's too complicated, so I simplified it kind of radically. So in this game, this is the, um, the information sharing game. Uh, there are two players, retailer and supplier, and um, retailer knows, so the, the demand can be either a high type or a low type, right? So there is only two types of demand. And, uh, high, high type demand looks like this. 
five percent chance that um, you know the demand is three, uh, thirty-three percent chance that it's two, and then two percent chance that it's one, and then the low type demand is flipped, right? So now there is almost a two-third chance that the demand is one, right? So uh, the a retailer moves first and he sees what demand type it is. So he doesn't know what the demand realization is, but he knows the type, right? And he can um, send the message to the supplier that says high or low. Is this still okay? Oh, it's not me. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so retailer moves first, sends a signal. Of course, the signal doesn't have to be truthful. Supplier uh, sees the signal and decides on production, uh, you know, either one, two, or three, um, and that's the game. So it's, it's much simpler than uh, other AL. Uh, I think it delivers the same message. Uh, and this is the payoffs, uh, so basically, I explain it, uh, I, I take a little bit of time to explain it in class, but basically it, um, if the retailer, if supplier knew retailer was truthful, then he would want to produce one when the demand is low and three when the demand is high. But if he doesn't trust the retailer, then he wants to produce two, right? So he maximizes his profit by producing two. So. Um, all right, so let's see. So um, I turned it on if you wanna, if you wanna play a few rounds of it. Okay, see already some people did. So by the way, is this one working on the phone fairly well? Can you, is it playable on the phone? It does give you the name of, your, of who you're playing with. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, you can do that. So that, that's an option. Um, you get uh, somewhat more collaboration. So if it's a class where people know each other, you get more collaboration with that. 
uh, if they if it's a big cluster they don't know each other it doesn't matter except like if somebody falls asleep then they can call out their name and say hey press a continue button Okay, so um, anyway, so this hopefully gives you an idea. So uh, these are the charts that I show them, and these actually look very different than what I see in class. So, um, so this is the trustworthiness chart, right? And so um, this is the proportion of people who truthfully revealed um, low demand. Uh, right, so that's, yeah, so truth about low demand, right? So 64%, so this is a good measure of trustworthiness, right? So this is, um, I guess, well, the reason it is because there's so much fewer people. So this is showing kind of what happened round by round, right? And so looks like um, basically everybody is saying um, let's see, Kalinas. So when the demand is high, everybody is saying that it's high, which makes sense and actually doesn't happen in the classroom. Um, and when the demand is low, uh, there are some people are truthful and some aren't and towards the end looks like you know, um, people are, uh, there, there is some cheap talk going on towards the end, right? Um, and so then, uh, so, 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 so this is one measure, truth about low demand, that's a matter of trustworthiness. And then um, the average order after uh, low demand and after high demand, uh, that is showing, that is a, uh, a measure of trust. So like for example, like this 2.67, there is a lot of trust here, right? And this is probably because people were truthful in the beginning, right? And so the supplier started trusting them and ordering three, right? And um, of course, order after low demand uh, is much lower, which is also what you would expect. Um, and so one thing that happens in this game, which I think is kind of interesting, is that some people um, when the demand is high, they say that it's low. So they don't always, um, they're not always truthful about, um, you know, about high demand. And uh, I never gotten a satisfactory answer about why they're doing it. They basically are saying something like, well, I want, uh, you know, I want to be credible, right? So I want to show them that I'm actually, uh, you know, telling them that the demand is low so that they trust me more in the future. All right, so this is pretty much it, right? So um, this is learning objective about that, private information, cheap talk, long-term relationships. So it's a vehicle for talking about that. Okay, so um, that's pretty much uh, it. Um, yeah, so if you are interested in, um, you, you know, in any of the stuff, uh, just send me an email or you can go to class.games and there is information about SOFI, but uh, I find it useful. I think that um, uh, s s students enjoy it and I hope more people will use um, you know, games in the classroom. Thank you very much, Elena. Yeah, do we have any questions uh, in the audience? All right, yeah. It actually has, 
<laughs> Just a very quick question. Yeah. Uh, uh, in your news vendor uh, game, um, in uh, I guess in the back of the engine, uh, what kind of distribution do you use? For which? Uh, like how do you generate those? Uh, Oh, uh, like in the news vendor? Correct. Uh, there is a, well, so there is a random number, right, right. that, uh, you know, a random, so, 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 so there is a random number function, okay. and that generates a number between zero and one, oh. right, and then you can write code to, uh, to, to get the normal distribution. Okay. okay. Right, and I guess you could write a code to get any kind of distribution if you wanted to, but yeah, just with that. So it's, it's pseudo-random number, right, it's not, but you, you don't really need anything fancy. I see. So, so we can actually control that, is it? Hmm? I mean, the, the user can control that ourselves. The, the instructor. Well, the ins it's programmed in. It's programming already. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for attending the session. All right. Thanks. <laughs>